Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Melinda Hartwig. I'm the curator of ancient Egypt, Nubia, and Near Eastern art here at the Michael C. Carlos Museum. It's wonderful to see so many of you out here today on what is an extraordinary day. I do have to say, we didn't even know if we would be doing this up until Thursday because we thought that uh, Hurricane Ian would be coming our way. And uh, thankfully, he passed by. And you know, our thoughts and prayers with those people who um, felt the destruction of the, of the hurricane. Uh, so um, it is my pleasure to start the ball rolling on this really exciting program. Um, RC, American Research Center in Egypt, for which I served as president for a number of years, and I'm still on the board, um, is doing a lecture tour in conjunction with the centenary of the discovery of Tutankhamun. So um, we are very, very lucky to have Betsy Bryan with us. Um, I would ask you all um, if you would become members of RC and uh, I'm sorry, ARCE. And also with my Carlos hat, I would love it if you would be members, of, if you would become members of the museum because uh, a number of these events we do broadcast um, through social media and also through direct mailings. So um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Louise Bertini, Executive Director of the American Research Center in Egypt, visiting from Cairo. Um, Dr. Bertini has served as RC's Executive Director since April 2019. She is an Egyptologist, a specialist in faunal analysis, and I have traveled with her and she will look at every single animal bone she finds on the ground, um, loves it. And uh, she's worked on more than 25 archeological projects in Egypt since 2003. She obtained her master's in Egyptology from the University of Liverpool and a PhD from, uh, in archeology span from Durham University. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Louise Bertini. So good afternoon. And thank you all for joining us today. Very happy to see so many of you here. Um, and we are honored to have your participation in celebrating the centenary uh, anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb by attending this lecture. Today's lecture is but one of many celebratory aspects uh, that we are doing this year um, as part of this celebration of the anniversary. In addition to this chapter tour, RC, in partnership with the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, will be hosting Transcending Eternity, the Centennial Tutankhamun Conference, 
later this year from November 4th to 6th in Luxor, Egypt. And we are also partnering with National Geographic to provide academic expertise and programming for their Beyond King Tut immersive experience, which provides an integrated media experience in cities across the country and online. It will be head headed to Atlanta in the coming months, so you can visit beyondkingtut.com for more information. Before we introduce our speaker, I want to take a moment to welcome those of you who may be new to RC. As an introduction, I'd like to share a brief video that provides an overview of our work for our nearly 75 year history in Egypt. It's, there we go. So as you can see, RC is a multifaceted organization focused on fieldwork, outreach, partnership and education and supporting others working in the field. A special note regarding partnership and fieldwork, I'm excited to share an important update on a new project that we are embarking on at the site of Abydos. Um, as some of you may know, Abydos is one of the most important burial sites of ancient Egypt that has a history extending back some 7,500 years. It was the cult center for the ruler of the dead, the god Osiris, and it was believed to be a physical gateway to the afterlife. In recent years, RC has committed significant resources to the conservation of different areas of the site and working in collaboration with our research supporting members. This year, RC's nomination of Abydos to the World Monuments Fund watch list was approved and a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the World Monuments Fund was subsequently signed. Using seed funds, a collaboration between RC and the World Monuments Fund was launched with a dual focus, the physical conservation of the Osirian and Meremta Tenel that lie immediately to the west of the Temple of Seti I, and the development of a management plan for the entire site. This work is made possible by so many of you. I'd like to express my gratitude to my fellow RC Georgia chapter members that are here today. 
RC has thousands of members across the globe comprised of Egyptologists, archaeologists, and many non-expert enthusiasts who simply find the history and culture of Egypt fascinating. If you are not a member, I encourage you to join and affiliate with our local RC Georgia chapter, and you can visit our table for more information. So now I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Betsy Bryant. Dr. Bryan is the Alexander Badui Professor Emerita of Egyptian Art and Archaeology at Johns Hopkins University, where she has taught since 1986. She specializes in the history and archaeology of the New Kingdom Egypt, circa 1600 to 1000 BC, with a particular emphasis on the 18th dynasty. Thanks to her efforts, Hopkins has a vigorous graduate program in Egyptology and applicants from all over the world have sought to study under her tutelage. Having traveled annually to Egypt since 1977, Dr. Bryan has developed a close attachment to the land and people. She is especially dedicated to training young Egyptian Egyptologists through the Hopkins Graduate Program. Dr. Bryan's dedication to strengthening the cultural ties between Egypt and the United States also finds expression in her activity on behalf of RC. She has served on multiple critical committees and working groups of the organization and has served as RC's most recent president of the Board of Governors. RC and the field of Egyptology are better and stronger today because of her leadership, dedication, and scholarship. Currently, Dr. Bryan is conducting field work in the temple complex of the goddess Mut in South Karnak. Her research there focuses on defining the earliest forms of the Temple of Mut at Ishuru. Today, Dr. Bryan will share with us her research on what life was like in the years between the reign of Amenhotep III and Tutankhamun. So if you now please join me in welcoming Dr. Bryan. Uh, thank you so much, Louise, for those kind, kind words, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, it's a great turnout, and um, I think the, the Carloses uh, and RC together seem like a, a match made in heaven, so uh, thank you so much uh, for your attendance, and I just want to be yet another voice to tell you that uh, if you haven't joined ARCE um, or the museum, uh, I'm sure anyone would be happy to help. Okay, so um, as uh, as Louise and, and Melinda have said, uh, this is a part of a series that ARCE is sponsoring because this is the 100th anniversary of the discovery um, of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, other, other, uh, other people who are giving lectures are really focusing more uh, directly on uh, the reign of Tutankhamun or on the tomb of Tutankhamun, Mark Gabold, um, who, who, uh, who gave some lectures earlier this summer, uh, certainly did that. Um, my role I see as being more to give you a larger context to understand what, how important was Tutankhamun? Um, and most importantly, the tomb of Tutankhamun is full of gold. Why is it full of gold? And that is one of the things that I'm going to perhaps put in uh, a few possibly uh, new radical suggestions um, on, on that particular topic. So the way I'm gonna approach this is to try and talk through this period of about 67 years. I don't know why I thought I could handle all that in one lecture um, and look at what Amenhotep III did in the city of Thebes, which we all know was dedicated at this time to the great god Amun-Re of Karnak. How did he build and transform it? And then look at what his son, Amenhotep IV, who changed his name to Akhenaten and became what we often call the heretic king, and who closed all the temples of Egypt just to meant to worship his one God, the Aten, what did he do to everything his father had done? And how did that change what Thebes looked like? And then what did Tutankhamun do in the aftermath of that? 
So that's kind of how we're going to be going through this. And this is the list of players. No one expects you. There will not be a quiz at the end. Um, but the part that we have the most controversy about on this list of, of rulers in the 18th dynasty gets to be where we get down to the successors to Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV. Um, for me, there is there are two kings or rulers named Ankhkepru Rey. The first one was a male who was probably the younger brother of Akhenaten, whose name was also Smenkhare. And the second was none other than his wife, Nefertiti, who called herself Ankhkepru Rey, Nefer Nefru Aten, when she ruled. Um, so you'll just hear me refer back to this uh, a little bit later. So now I'm going to try and move on. So just as we start, we want to remember what is Thebes like at the time that Amenhotep III came to the throne. Now here's an aerial view. This is Karnak here. This is the West Bank of Thebes. And the, if you've heard of Hatshepsut, the, the queen who ruled as a king, uh, that is the bay in which her, her temple was built. Um, but the main importance that we want to think about is that this is roughly the time around the 15th century BC. Egypt has been at war. Egypt has new wealth coming in as a result of having defeated Nubians to the south and a little later people from the Levant uh, in the north. And Thebes is becoming a place dedicated to praising, worshiping, and developing the god Amun-Re as the national god of Egypt. So the Egyptians referred to Karnak by the name Ipitsut. It means the gathering of thrones. They also will say in their text that they refer to the house of Amun, the pear Amun. But that doesn't really mean the temple. It means all of the lands, all of the people, all of the herds that are owned by that particular institution. And so think about the fact that Thebes in this time is not just a series of temp or a temple built to this king, but it is all of the land and all of the people. And if we look back at how this sort of city of Thebes was being transformed with all of this new found wealth from their campaigning in the south particularly, we find that it's Hatshepsut, the woman who reigned as king, who was the first to really focus on creating a sort of new ritual city. And what she did was to build the in Karnak Temple itself here, and she built a new temple where I work at the Temple of Moot. This is the goddess Moot's precinct. And she also built a small shrine down here at what we now call Luxor Temple. And there were separate rituals that were celebrated um, in over here. Now, one additional place that she built is her funerary temple on the west side of the river. And she didn't build it just to house her funerary cult, but here she also designed a temple for the goddess Hathor, where they could celebrate another very important ritual called the beautiful feast of the valley. And in both that one and the one in Luxor temple, the god amun Ray of Karnak was a visitor. He would come during that ritual, his statue would be brought over. So Hatshepsut needs to get a lot more credit for actually having sort of created this ritualized circuit. And these are blocks from her so-called red chapel um, at Karnak that show the boat of the god amun Re um, being carried to different rest spots on its way uh, to these feasts. But the king who really then gave more funding and resources to the Temple of Karnak than anyone ever before was, in fact, Hatshepsut's stepson. That is, 
um, Thutmose III, who was her nephew and stepson. And he, he was actually a co-regent with her for the whole time that she was on the throne, but he was a little boy. And she just sort of, after a couple of years, shoved him into the background and ignored him for a bit. Uh, and when he grew up, um, he wasn't going to be ignored anymore. So he went out to campaign for more than 20 years in, uh, in the military and brought back enormous wealth um, from the Levant. And he dedicated it in the temple of Karnak to the god Amun. And here he is right here making dedications. You might be able to see a couple of obelisks there that he dedicated. But I want you to really focus on all of this stuff because these are all representations of gold and electrum and silver objects and ingots that he gave for Amun Re to fill the coffers into these sealed treasuries um, of this particular temple. Um, now, in addition, we see that if we look at how Karnak actually changed from the beginning of the dynasty through the reign of Thutmose III, it goes from being a very, very small place, very small building, to then having its first stone pylon uh, in the, soon thereafter, Hatshepsut, she built a very, very large pylon. That's a gate, a huge gateway. And, but you'll notice it's on a different axis. And what she did was to point to the way for her rituals that she was building up. So this led you to the goddess Moot's precinct, where at the time of the so-called Opet festival at Luxor Temple, they would take Karnak, the statue of Amun from Karnak, they would go down this way, they would get the goddess statue from Mut, and then they would go on down to the Luxor shrine and have their celebration there. The same thing would happen when they went to the Valley Festival on the other side of the river. Now, suddenly we jump to Thutmose III, and what do we have now? We have a huge enclosure wall. We have a sacred lake, which hadn't been there before. And we have several new pylons. He built the seventh pylon, he built the fifth pylon, he built the sixth pylon. Um, and so the, the precinct of Karnak suddenly is absolutely enormous. And not only that, but the priesthood of Amun is extremely wealthy, but it's not just the priests that are wealthy. In fact, the wealthiest people in this time period, these are some of the buildings that he contributed, were the people who administered the so-called pear Amun, that is the estates of Amun, and they were called the stewards of Amun. They weren't priests, they were the people who counted all the herds and the lands and the people who were in, under the control of the temple. Now that didn't necessarily mean, by the way, the gold. That was in the control of whoever got the seal. And the seal might not be in the hands of the stewards, but in any case, they were very powerful people. Now Karnak was important for one additional thing in addition to Amun Re, and that is that it was a place where the Egyptians celebrated the cults of deceased kings from the past. So it was almost a place when it says gathering of thrones, it means the gathering of all these deceased and now divine rulers of the past to just, excuse me, to celebrate the time that they have given uh, it as, uh, as rulers. And and so um, Thutmose III was very active uh, in building shrines for that all around uh, Karnak Temple. Now, one last thing that he built, which was on the east end, is a temple called the, the, uh, the Eastern Temple, because it's at the eastern end, which is the, where facing the sun rising, right? That's where the sun rises. And at that place, Thutmose III planned to put up a single obelisk, which we now call the sole obelisk. Um, and he, he actually never put it up. He had it made 
but it was found by his grandson lying on the ground 35 years later. And his grandson put it up and completed what was then the Eastern temple uh, to, devoted to Amun as a sun god um, with the sole obelisk as its feature. Now the, the obelisk is a solar symbol already, but having just one focuses it um, onto this one emblem. And I'm gonna return to that later. Now this same grandson, Thutmose IV, um, is responsible for having built a, uh, a courtyard in front of the Karnak temple and filled it with small buildings. So he is the last king before Amenhotep III who is completely focused on looking at um, at Amun Ray's temple in Karnak. Now, in fact, he is so focused on it that he is, whenever he is adding something, he has it depicted on his courtyard. So here he is. Amun Ray is the one with the plumes on his head. I can't really see it from the side here. I guess he's the one on the right. Um, and then he, he's shown here seated, receiving from his is from um, uh, Thutmose IV, all the things. And among the things that, um, that Thutmose IV donates to him is this little building, which is actually a porch right in front of the entrance to Karnak. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that we have um, in the tomb of the second priest of Amun, a depiction of exactly that same little porch. And I wanna point out to you that it was gold. Now this building was probably partially wood and partially stone and stood out from in front of the pylon. But the amount of gold that was actually being donated at this time is going up and up all the time and not coming down and down. In fact, the steward of Amun of the same time period depicts a huge wall of golden objects that he has. And guess what he has? He has the seal. So he controls the treasury. Um, and even the second priest of Amun, his tomb is actually not nearly as large as the tomb of the steward of Amun. So now we have Amenhotep III and we're gonna look at how he altered Thebes. So right now our focus is still purely on Karnak temple. Even the funerary temples that were being built in this time with the single exception of Hatshepsut's were quite small. And they were even built with brick pylons and a little bit of stone. So they were nothing uh, to write home about. Amen, Amenhotep III did not live in Thebes. He was a northerner. So was Tutankhamun, by the way. And they, he probably never spent any time here until his third decade. But once he did, he moved here probably, in my view, he moved there and stayed somewhere around his 25th year and he reigned until his 38th. And he began to build a, a brand new temple that is the Luxor temple, the so-called Ipet Resi. Now I told you that Hatshepsut was already celebrating the Opet festival here. He took down her building and he built a brand new one and he built it sort of from the rear forward. And he tells us in his inscriptions that it has, um, I'm gonna have to read it from on here, that it has been having walls of electrum and floors of silver uh, and everything being worked to the extreme. Now I'm gonna keep revisiting this point, but the fact is that we often skip past these kinds of statements on the part of people like Amenhotep III or Thutmose III who tell us that they built this thing and covered it with uh, precious metals. But in fact, they had all of that wealth. So what does Amenhotep III want to do here? He has swept away what was there and he has built a brand new temple. Now this temple was for the celebration of the Opet feast, primarily. And the Opet was a renewal of kingship. Now the kingship of the living king was renewed there over several weeks. The king went in 
the statues of the gods Amun Re, Mut, and their son Kansu went into the temple and they were carried into the rear and then they weren't seen again for a while. Now, what he added inside of Luxor Temple to the Opet Festival was this room, the room for the sacred marriage that took place between Amun Re and his mother, Mut Emwia. This had not been part of the Opet Festival, as far as we know, up until this moment, but it did seem like a very reasonable thing to do for him to literally be reborn as the son of the actual living Amun Re inside of Opet, uh, uh, of the, during the Opet Festival inside of Luxor Temple. When he emerged finally, he is kneels down in front of Amun Re who then confers his crowns on him. And he is accepted as a renewed king. And this was so popular, let's say, with the kings who followed him, that for 1500 years, people, including Alexander the Great, including Roman emperors, came to Luxor Temple to have the Opet Festival renewal take place. So this was a brilliant stroke on his part uh, to take that and put himself in that place of being the son of Amun. Now, one other thing he did, though, is he added in the rear part of behind where the sacred marriage was and the opit took place, a hall of columns. Now, this hall, instead, the rest of the temple is oriented north-south, but this is oriented east and west. And inside of it, is a, uh, is a dedication that connects you when you go east-west to the other side of the river. Now it's not a connection to Karnak, now it's a connection to temples that are on the west side of the river. And what is over there that it would be focusing on? Well, it's the temple of Medinet Habu, the small temple of Medinet Habu, where there is a, another kind of Amun Re, who is an Amun Re associated sort of with the earth itself. And it, it is, uh, the, the decision was made by Amenhotep III to connect to that God. And if you then leave that hall and go into the Holy of Holies, what you find is that new Amun Re that he worships in the back of Luxor Temple. And that Amun Re is Ithiphalic, and he is connected very much to the God of Bedidit Habu on the other side of the river. Now, one of the things that's fascinating is in this scene, directly above this scene right here is this one, which unfortunately I don't have a photograph of. But what you see the king doing here is the opening of the mouth ceremony. This means that he is quite literally initiating a brand new cult of the god Amun. This is not Amun from Karnak. This is the Karn Amun that he has created and is dedicating here in Luxor Temple. Now, why do I want to comment on that? Well, the reason is that throughout his 20 years of building in Thebes, Amun Hotep is not doing what everybody did before him and building in Karnak and offering to the god of Karnak. What he's doing is using the resources of Amun Re of Karnak to build other temples. And he's actually creating new versions of that god while he's doing it. And it's all linked to him because it's all about renewing his kingship, making him the son of Amun. So it's a very interesting way of using the ritual pattern that they have of coming from Karnak down to Luxor, going over to the West Bank to, the, to Medinet Habu, going to the Valley Feast, and then going back. But what he's doing is putting the emphasis on the going away and not nearly so much on the coming back because when they get there, they get to experience this brand new things that he has built. Now you'll notice, even here, this statue, which is made of quartzite, you might be able to see those roughened patches. Can you see those? 
it, this is well known that this statue was completely gilded in antiquity. It was covered with gold and the roughening is in order to keep the, uh, the metals uh, on it. So this would have been quite a striking statue of him. Okay, so now we wanna take a look on the other side. This is where we are just looking at that he built the Ipit Resi. Now we're gonna look at his funerary temple, which he built uh, on the west side of the river. This is Karnak and it's red because he hasn't even done anything there yet. What he built was an enormous space to celebrate the cult of him as an eternal king. The Colossi of Memnon that I know all of you all are gonna be seeing, many of you will be going on tours in the next six months and you're gonna visit the Colossi of Memnon. This is his funerary temple, but look, there's not just one set, there's actually three sets of these gargantuan statues with what had been pylon gateways um, behind them. And <clears throat> here we can just um, begin to look at the entire area um, of this region. Sorry, did I lose? Uh, here, sorry. Um, yeah, so here's the, here's the side of the temple on that side. And here is a reconstruction on, of the, by their conservators of what the area would have looked like. And here is their reconstruction of the overall Nairi Hampikian, um, who was one of their architects uh, and extremely capable person has done this reconstruction. So here are the Colossi of Memnon. And then there's three sets of these colossal in front of three gigantic um, pylons, and then the actual temple uh, behind it. Now, just the size of the space is there because it's wide open in order to house festivals. Now, the most important festival on the West Bank up until this time was, of course, the beautiful Feast of the Valley, which has been going to Dero Bahri, to Hatshepsut's temple. And now, Amenhotep III even writes in his inscriptions that he wants Amen to come to his temple for the Valley Festival. This is the wonderful Horik Seruzian who has been working at the temple um, for 25 years now. Um, she's responsible for not only finding these new colossi, but also putting them up. Uh, and um, I, I can't say enough uh, about her. She's pretty colossal herself and more of the colossal statues that she has uh, rebounded with over the time. But another thing about this statue, this particular temple that Amenhotep III did is aside from these gigantic images, and they're of him, of course, the Colossi of Memnon represent him. He had life-size stone statues made in the hundreds of other gods. And sometimes he would show himself with those gods as he does here with the moon god, but sometimes it would be just the deity. But in all cases, there was a dedication on the inscriptional dedication that associates that god directly to Amenhotep. So by the time his funerary temple was done and the rituals were being enacted, he was actually connecting himself to every god in Egypt. The divine energy flowed through him and through them. But you could not separate him from the god Ta, the god Re Harakti, the god Amun Re. He was all of them and they were he. And that was what he produced here. The last thing he did here, it kind of doesn't stop, is he created a statue cult. So when he made those gargantuan statues, the so-called Colossi of Memnon, on the back of them, he puts an inscription and these things are named and they have a name that turns them into a divine intermediary image. And their, his, his name of the Colossi of Memnon is Nebmat Re, is the ruler, Nebmat Re is his throne name, is the ruler of rulers. And he beckons people to come in front of these humongous images and make a request to him. And he 
will actually be the answerer, not Amun Ray of Karnak, Amun Hotep, who resides in this particular place. Now, this particular one, which is more of a life-size statue, is also a named statue. It's Nebmat Ray, ruler of rulers, firm and enduring forever with that addition. This one, actually, I was lucky enough to make the join for because the top is in the British Museum and I found the bottom, which matches perfectly uh, in the basement of the Cairo Museum some years ago. Um, so it's, um, so it, there, he had a number of these statues that were actually divine forms of him that could be addressed by the people. And he wanted that. To, to be the case. So by the time that um, we finish with this particular addition to Thebes, um, he has created this space for the celebration um, of the beautiful Feast of the Valley and for his personal Jubilee festivals, which he held in years 30, 34, and 37. Um, and he has created these statue cults to make himself the focus of, of local pious uh, admiration and worship. And he's identified himself with every god in all of Egypt. Um, but nonetheless, since Amun Re of Karnak is going to come there, and he even says this in inscription, I want my father Amun Re to come and visit, he could charge Amun Re's Karnak for the whole thing. Now, he also works at the Temple of Moot, where, <clears throat> where I've been working, but he was much more clever when he got to Moot because Hatshepsut had actually built the temple there. And this is, we only have really the leftovers of this temple, sadly. But what he did, which was very clever, you could just see a little shadow, which represents the platform that Hatshepsut built. And <clears throat> her porch had these big square pillars on it. So what did Amenhotep III do? He just built one wall all the way around it, which he carved with images of himself offering to Moot and Amun Re, and then put columns in on a porch in front, and bingo, it looks like it's all his. From the outside, looks good. But he also, of course, dedicated statues to the god of the goddess Sekhmet, both there and at his funerary temple, hundreds of them. And here is his addition there. This is the goddess Moot's legs. And you can't really tell it, but He brought Amun Ray of Karnak there, but really to focus the new worship that he wanted to promote in this temple. Now, he also finally, in the very last years of his reign, built something in Karnak. And that was a brand new pylon in the front of the temple the so-called third pylon. And when he finally made that decision somewhere around year 33 of his 38th year, he literally took down that court that his own father had built and filled with things. He took everything that was there and used it in the foundations of the pylon that he built. And on the Eastern side of that pylon, he depicted the boat, the so-called barge of Amun Re on its way to the Moot Temple to pick up Moot and to go on down to the new Luxor Temple, which he had built to celebrate the Opet Festival. Last thing he did, the very last, and he never finished it, was he started building a 10th pylon, which was on the way to the Moot Temple. And so that would be up. I really can't see much of anything. Yeah, it would be this one. Um, and <clears throat> he, um, he's, he only got eight courses of it finished, but he started as he did it 
to build a new statue of himself. He got his, his uh, close courtier Amenhotep sort of Hapu to direct this work. It was a 70 foot standing statue of him made out of quartzite. You can see the little kid who's just here at the bottom of the sockle and there's the sides of his foot. And he named this statue, another one that was a sort of God intermediary. He named this one, Nebmat Ray is Montu of rulers. Well, to us, that doesn't sound so unusual, except that it couldn't be more insulting. <laughs> Montu was the other God of Amun, of, of, of Thebes, not Amun Ray. Um, it was as if he were rubbing it right in their faces by calling himself the Montu of rulers, 70 feet high in front of Amun Ray's temple of Karnak. So that's the end of his work. This is what he had done. He created an enormous set uh, of, of buildings to create a flow for rituals, but those rituals took the people away from Karnak for celebration. <clears throat> now, I've talked to, again about how much gold and so forth this king had, and Amun and Thutmose III, all these people dedicating it. I want to just make one point here, which is that we shouldn't be too dubious, because a few years ago, in cleaning the floors right outside of Hatshepsut's suite around the main shrine of Karnak, they discovered that the sand on the ground was full of silver, which is exactly what they said that they did, which was to mix silver grains in with the flooring um, when they talk about working the floors in silver. So we really do have to take seriously when they tell us that they do these things. Now, one place that's very famous for that is the so-called obelisk of Hatshepsut, which is still standing. Do you see this, the color change? From that point on, it was wrapped in electrum all the way to its top. And the, at Dendera Temple, it, people, Peter Brand has written a wonderful article in which he discusses, you see all those little holes? This is how they attached sheets of, of solid met, precious metals um, in front of the face um, of the goddess Hathor. Well, Amenhotep III's marriage is exactly like that. Do you see the patterning here? What they did when they restored it after Akhenaten's people had really bloodied up Amun Re uh, here, they, they came in and they created big sheets of copper because gold is just too soft to stay on a wall uh, in that size. So they took sheets of copper and riveted it to the to the stone and then fold the gold sheets around it. And these would not have been thin. We're not talking about gold leaf. We're talking about sheets of gold. So <clears throat> enormous amounts of wealth um, are going into these places. Now, the last thing I wanted to look at is the recent work of Zahi Hawass on the West Bank, because this was the city that Amenhotep III founded and lived in for those last 20 years of his reign, but also where his son was living and who continued to live for another five years after Amenhotep III passed away. And he built his city um, in on that we he called the Dazzling Aten, or Nebmat Ray is the Dazzling Aten. Um, and it took up an enormous space on the west side of the Nile. In fact, now we know that it stretched all the way from down here where he had built a harbor and a set of palaces all the way up to the funerary temple. And this is the area here where Dr. Hawass has been working and filling in a big gap for us of understanding how big this city actually was. In many ways, it was very much a model for the one that Akhenaten built at Amarna. <clears throat> now here's a little bit of a close up of, of the area that Dr. Hawass works at. It's a industrial area and with 
dozens of kilns, places sandal making was going on. Um, they were bread making. These are kerns for rolling out dough. Um, these are more kilns here. Um, and benches for doing for leaning over to do work. And when we look at it from above, we also see that over here is a, a very interesting pile of stone. This is granodiorite. It's a stone that comes from Aswan and it piles and piles of it, but it's a debitage. It's what's left over when after you've worked in stone. And this would almost certainly be where they were working on those wonderful statues for the temple of Amenhotep III. They left these piles and piles and piles of bits of debitage. So Amenhotep III passes away and his son, son is still there. And at that point, we actually can find ceilings from the city that name him. This is his throne name, Neferkepru Re, and his second name was Amenhotep. And we, but we have an even earlier one from before his father died that actually refers to him as the king's son, Amenhotep. So he was living, we know now, in the middle palace um, at Malkata um, and is um, um, continued to live there for another five years after his father passed. Among the, in the storeroom where, where he, uh, where Dr. Hawass was, uh, uh, has been working and gathering materials, there are a lot of mud ceilings from vessels. This one does seem to actually refer to a pair. Now it's either Ray or Otten. And it says numerous of rituals. So <clears throat> This could really very well be from the reign of Amenhotep IV, who will become Akhenaten. And this ceiling is equally interesting because it names not only the, the ibis-headed god Thoth, but also Aten again, and calls him beloved of ankh em -mat. Now that means living on truth. And living on truth was an epithet for Akhenaten himself and for his god, the Aten. So it does seem that Dr. Hawass has got quite a bit of material that relates to the development of this brand new religion that Amenhotep IV is creating um, right there in Thebes at the end of his father's reign. So he really does change the light landscape of Thebes. And the first thing he does to do that is to actually get access to people to quarry stone. He sends them to the great quarries at Jebel Silsila, which is the sandstone quarries well south of Thebes. And he left a, a large, large rock cut stela there from his very first year where he is shown Unfortunately, you can see it's been completely obliterated because after Akhenaten's death, most of his monuments were treated the same way he had treated Amun Re uh, during his lifetime. So, <clears throat> but the, this drawing was done in the middle of the 19th century uh, by the Lepsius group. And what it shows is the king standing in front of Amun Re with the plumes and making an offering. And the inscription starts with utterance by Amen Re. So everything that the stela says is put in the mouth of Amen Re of Karnak. And what does he say? He announces in here that they're quarrying stone to build a temple in Karnak for Re Harakti, a completely different deity. And it's the Ben-Ben of the great Ben-Ben of Re Harakti in his name of Shu, which is in, uh, which is in the Aten, in Ipit suit, then the name of Karnak. And so they actually one more time get away with having the temple of Karnak. Amun Re of Karnak is now paying to have Re Harakti move in and build his own temples right on the same area. 
And what did he, where did he build it? He built it at a place that I mentioned to you before, which is where the sole obelisk is. It's the far east end of the temple. In many ways, it wasn't really in the temple proper. It was just outside of it. And he built it right here where the sole obelisk was. And then he built the building around it. That building currently is one that Ramses II put up, but recent excavations by the French have shown that it replaced an earlier building. And now the French Chapaz and Carlotti and a number of others have suggested that this is indeed where Amenhotep IV's great Ben-Ben uh, to Ray Harakti was placed. A Ben-Ben being a stone, a rounded stone that is a solar symbol and is often then turned into an obelisk form. Now this building, this is what it would have looked like. There was a platform and then they surrounded the obelisk that way, um, <clears throat> was in a traditional style. It, 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 the blocks for it show his Ray Harakti, which is a falcon headed God and the king offering to him looking very much in the same style as his father. <clears throat> Elsewhere in, in one place in Karnak in front of his father's pylon, he did leave one scene that he honored Amun in, but every other thing he did in this in Thebes itself was devoted to the god Ray Harakti and then Aten a few years later. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we have to get into our heads now is that we think of him spending five years in Thebes, and he did. But most of that time, he spent trying to figure out how to raise money to build a new city. And he was not in control, from what we can tell, of the seal to all the treasuries. He had access to the pear almond, so he had the people and the land, and he could do something with that, and that's why he had access to go to the quarries and send workers. But it's not until almost the end of his fourth year that we can say with certainty that he started building like crazy in, temp in, in Thebes. But what did he do? Well, he issued a lot of proclamations. He was very big on talking. And he, let, he did make a tax decree. Now his tax decree was fascinating because it required every temple in Egypt to make a donation to his new god, Ray Harakti. And it set exactly what that annual amount was going to be for each temple. And these are some of the temples that I would take right out of the inscription. <clears throat> one Deban of silver, one container of incense, a men container, two men containers of wine, two rectangular links of thick cloth. That's it. One Deban of silver is 3.2 ounces. So this is nothing. In other words, he just simply does not have the clout to get the temples to send him what he wants. So where is he getting his money from? He's actually getting it from himself, his own estates, and his father's estates, which he's able to raid like crazy. And the last place that he was taxing were the mayors of all the city, uh, major cities of Egypt. Now that he was successful at because frankly, he could send police to rough them up if they didn't show up. The temples could claim that they were exempt. And so they didn't really have a problem. But the mayors really later on were complaining a great deal, which is why Horemheb, king at the end of this dynasty, had to pass an edict in which he sort of reversed uh, all of this stuff. So he's working at it, but the fact of the matter is that he really does not have the resources to do it. And it's not until the very late period, late fourth year and early fifth, that he is able to now suddenly announce his new form of God. He changes from the style that he had been doing, a very traditional style. He makes his God into the Aten the sun disk with rays coming down and hands at the end of the rays. And he 
changes the style of him. He places his God's names into cartouches and he begins to build for that God outside of Karnak temple on the east side, a brand new temple that is all open air. Huge platforms with altars that he would put food on and then there would be then colonnades that had statues of him in it. So this is some of the decoration. Now this is when he also invents this or his people invented for him stones that are very small, 56 centimeters in length um, that were could be carried by one person at a time and they could build with them again, open air. So there's no roofing here. You can put it up really fast. And what he shows is him being honored by his God. Um, and he shows lots and lots and lots of food because this he has access to. And also bear in mind these, what he has done in the four years that he's been there is not to worship at the temple of Luxor where the renewal of the kingship took place not to go to the West Bank and do the beautiful Feast of the Valley because he's not going to do anything on behalf of Amun. So he's been sitting over on the east end of Karnak pretty much all alone for four years. Now that doesn't really work with the population that is used to going to festivals. That's how they got the best food of the year. They, most of these people never got meat unless they went to a festival where it was served for free. So what did he do? He proclaimed that he was gonna have a Jubilee, a, a festival. And he celebrated that festival by inviting the population to come to East Karnak and, uh, to, and partake. Uh, and that's one way to win over uh, the people. And this, these were some of the things that he did depict. So he depicted all the food and then he also depicted the festival itself, him being honored uh, at his own jubilee. He also had statues of himself made. Now this is interesting because this came from the so-called colonnade that he was building over there in the very last moments before he left to go to Amarna. Um, and he had a whole series of these sandstone colossi made, but we now really have realized that they didn't look like this originally. Originally they were this represented their surface. So in other words, they were traditional statues of him, colossal statues of him, that were then cut back to create his brand new art style. So he has this, this weird tiny little waist, a sort of barrel-like chest, uh, a drooping belly, um, and a very, very long, narrow uh, face. Um, this extreme look um, is what he ended up with as he created this brand new art style. And he used the, his own statues to work it out um, uh, and put them up uh, in his temple. Meanwhile, as I say, all the rest of Karnak is now from year four and five, he's now suddenly on the Talatat here, no longer he now starts to call this Pear Aten. That is, he calls Thebes Pear Aten, the House of Aten. So he changes the name that used to be called the Pear Amun, that is the Estates of Amun, to Pear Aten. And when he got, and he calls it Pear Aten in the Southern Heliopolis, which is the name for Thebes. When he gets to Amarna, he calls it Pear Aten in Akit Aten, which is his name for Amarna. So he now somehow in year late year four and early five, he has now gotten access to at least all of the landed wealth, herds and people um, that had been in the control of the Amun priesthood. But there's still not one shred of evidence that he ever got access to those sealed treasuries where the gold and the silver was. Now, I got really fascinated by this question and I did a full search. If you search for the words gold, electrum and silver from the time that he left 
Luxor till the time that he dies. How many instances? One, and that is his Electrum chariot, which he almost certainly had in Thebes and took with him to Amarna. There is not one reference to building or using gold in a royal inscription in the entirety of the Amarna group. And we have a lot of texts. So I think it's really likely that he simply didn't have any access to it. And so what did he do then the rest of his time? He started before he left attacking like crazy on Amun Re and Amun Re's wife Moot and anything that was their emblem. He had it mutilated. And after he left and moved to Amarna, he continued to do that until he died in his 17th year. He got more and more virulent as the time went on. But his changes that took place, here's more of it that he destroyed. Now, you see them there, but that's just because they were restored by others later. Now, when you see all of the blue that we had earlier, where Amenhotep III had built here, and he built here, and he built here, and all of this, the only thing that Akhenaten built is this little yellow. All the rest of this represents him mutilating the rest of Steve's. Then he dies and we get the return to Thebes. Now, interestingly, the first ruler who appears from Amarna after Akhenaten's death is Nefertiti, Nefer Nefru Aten. And she, her name comes up in a graffito from a tomb that Dr. Hartwig knows extremely well, the tomb of Pairi. Uh, she wrote about it in a number of places. Uh, and that graffito actually names um, Ankh Kepru Ray um, and also uh, Nefer Nefru Aten here. And it mentions not only that this is the third year of this ruler's reign, but it says that this ruler is in Thebes. And then it mentions that there is a temple in Thebes for Ankh-Kepru Re. So we know that we should be looking for some place that was dedicated for Nefertiti as ruler uh, in Thebes itself. It might have been taken over by somebody else. Uh, we don't know, but it is really interesting to note um, that it's there. Now, I want to just add to this. All of this is being written, giving praise to Amun, kissing the grand to whenever, that's Osiris, by the Wab priest scribe of offerings, Hawak, the scribe of offerings for Amun. So in other words, Nefer Nefru Aten Nefertiti in her third year has already started abandoning Aten and worshiping Amun in Amun city. So even Tutankhamun was not the first ruler to start the uh, restoration. Now, the other thing that we know is that Nefer Nefru Aten's name had been on lots of the material found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. It, this is one example where you see the only thing that was original in these cartouches is the sun sign, because you can see that it's still the carnelian or red glass. The rest of it has a layer of gold that's been put on top of it in order to put a new name in. Um, but when Carter was digging his way up to the door, to discover the tomb of Tutankhamun, he hit a cache of material in the debris that had the names of other rulers in it. And one of them was this box lid, and it names the names of Akhenaten and of Ankh-Kepru Re. Uh, so this would be Nefertiti and Akhenaten before he died. There was a whole group of material. None of it had precious metal, none of it. And what Nicholas Reeves has said is that he is sure that this was material that had been brought from Amarna after Akhenaten's death 
bound down to thieves. That was what this cache of material was. Now, <clears throat> so if we talk now about Tut, he was on the throne for eight years. Almost certainly he wasn't himself personally active in this time period. He was probably living up in Memphis, but I um, was the man I was working for him. And among the first things that he was doing was starting the restoration. This is the so-called restoration stila in his name, in which he says that the temples had been found in ruins and they are, the gods were very unhappy. And so Tutankhamun is going to make it all right by making new dedications for them. That is what he is most known for outside of his tomb. His tomb is certainly more important than anything, but it is his restoration of the cult of Amun. And when he did it, not only did he start to have things fixed that had been mutilated, but he also dedicated large numbers of statues in the form of Amun, in this case, his consort Amunet. Um, and he also brags in here and says his Majesty took counsel with his heart, seeking every excellent deed, searching what was beneficial to his father Amun, fashioning his noble image of real electrum. And throughout the restoration stila, he talks about using precious metal, something Akhenaten does not say one time about anything that he built. Now, his restoration really was just that things that had been mutilated. This was the goddess Moot. This is from our work at the Moot Temple. You can see all of the hacking that had gone on. And then it's been recarved with the face of Tadank Amun uh, in front of, actually, this is King Thutmose III or Hatshepsut. And another example of another, what, this is another artist, but of the same time period, replacing one that had been hacked away. So that is really an important element of what Tutankhamun was doing. But what else did he do? He really honored Amenhotep III. He wanted almost more than anything, or I in his place, to sweep away what Akhenaten had done and to restore meant to honor the king right before that who did build for Amun, even if he didn't, he did it for his own good. So what did Tutankhamun do? He had images of himself placed behind the image of Amun, Amenhotep III on the pylon that Amenhotep III had built. And here's another example of him placing himself in that particular role. But he also added small little vignettes that show him in front of the god Amun on the bark so that some of them say Amenhotep third and some of them say Tutankhamun. So he associates himself very, very closely um, with what probably was his grand grandfather. And another thing he did is since Amenhotep III is uh, active at the Moot Temple, he, Tutankhamun, actually builds the Sphinx Alley that connects Karnak Temple's 10th pylon with the Moot Temple. And he makes this Sphinx Alley out of Sphinxes of Akhenaten's and Nefertiti's. So he is really rejecting, or I on his behalf, is really rejecting the whole period of Amarna. Now, lastly, he goes to the building at Ipit Resi, the Luxor temple where Amenhotep III was so busy, and adds the decoration of the colonnade there, here that this is the colonnade that actually is dedicated to the Opet festival, the renewal of kingship. And you have twin representations on him, of him as you enter into that colonnade. Now he doesn't look like a little boy, he looks like a grown man. So perhaps even this is one of the later images or at least is meant to make him look uh, like he's a, a grown man here. And represented in his colonnade are dancers and processions that are going to the Luxor Temple from Karnak um, for the celebration of the Opet Festival, including the barks of Amun Re and of Moot, which are shown here resting uh, when they got there. We also do have from Karnak 
some blocks that represent a building called the mansion of Nebkepru Ray, which was his throne name. Um, and these are blocks that have things like chariots. Uh, there is obviously the king is shown in a sort of military fashion, but they're also offering scenes. Um, this particular building, Ray Johnson actually wrote his dissertation about, um, and some people have thought it was Tutankhamun's funerary temple. But the blocks have been found in Karnak Temple. So the big question we have is where did it actually stand? Um, I think these days the preponderance of evidence is that Tutankhamun did not build a funerary temple on the West Bank. I know Dr. Hawass doesn't want to hear that, but um, most of the evidence would suggest that if he had one, it was done by I very late, probably as Tutankhamun was dying, and it was dedicated to him uh, in Karnak Temple. So when we look now at all the things that Amenhotep III had done, we see that Tutankhamun was busy in at least a couple of those. This is still Akhenaten all over here all by himself. And when we finally get to the tomb, what do we get in that tomb? Lots and lots of gold, which I think the steward of Amun for the pair Amun under Amenhotep III, who lasted into the early reign of Amenhotep IV, Keruweth, and worked for the queen, Queen T, I think he's the one who kept the seal on the treasury. Because I don't think that this is the gold that we have. Even when Tudank Aten was Tudank Aten, this chair was probably not made in Amarna. He was already still, he was still Tudank Aten when he was in, when he was, when he was, the stuff was made for him there. And <clears throat> a lot of stuff was made for Nefer Nefru Aten, whom we see here. This is the queen, Nefertiti name changes. And finally, all of this. So who had the gold? This is Queen T, his mother, Amenhotep IV's mother. She had moved up to the Fayum. This is a statue of hers. And underneath this particular headdress, CT scans have shown us that she is wearing a solid silver and gold crown. Very, very royal-like. Um, I suspect very strongly that they kept control over all of that sealed wealth so that when Tutankhamun's time came, it was there and available and it was plenteous. Thank you very much for thinking. Thank you, Dr. Hawass. Um, that was brilliant. Uh, I kind of, I've, I've never heard of looking at the economic power of gold and how this lent itself to um, various things that happened in the rain and then also the sacred landscape of Thebes. Um, well done. <laughs> Do you, uh, are any questions? Okay, well, I'm gonna do it then. <laughs> Um, it is fascinating about Akhenaten not having access to the, the gold of Karnak. And I know that he had some texts where he, uh, it, it was pretty clear that he was having issues with the priesthood. Um, and, the, and yet his father had all of this at his disposal. It, it, you know, is there any kind of trigger or a series of triggers that would have turned the priesthood off? Um, Akhenaten, was it his new style of statuary? Was it, you know, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. I, I mean, I, first of all, I want to say that we may not be talking, we're not necessarily talking about the economic power of gold because they didn't use it as cash, but we do know that it, its prestige value in terms of diplomatic exchange and in terms of what you could ask for and get um, was very, very important. And also, 
it had its own prestige value, just as the skin of the gods. I mean, that's what gold was to the Egyptians. And um, so the luxury prestige value was, uh, was enormous. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, ask me again. Oh, so were there a series of triggers yeah, um, okay. that turned the priesthood? That, yeah. They took the key away. I think it was, I mean, I think Amenhotep III got away with what he did, which, you know, he was a megalomaniac. There's no question about that. But I think he got away with it because he never abandoned Amun Ray. Even if he was renaming cults of Amun Ray, it was always Amun Ray. And I mean, and maybe the fact that he built the third pylon was because he was feeling a squeeze to some extent. I mean, because it, it's amazing how late the addition of the, his new uh, pylon at Karnak really was. But in any case, I think that that's how he gets away with it. I think that the offense of um, Akhenaten is when he actually does go to Silsila and start building a temple to Ray Harakti just outside the main portion um, of Karnak and really totally only give lip service to the God. And then after that, he's putting up these decrees. And we think these decrees were actually, you know, on the sides of that monument around the Sol Obelisk because they're on the, from the same set of, of blocks that came out of the ninth and 10th pylon. Um, so, um, I mean, obviously we don't know with certainty for sure, but, um, I, I think that we, I think we have to assume that when he is changing all the personnel very, very rapidly in charge of things, like, for example, he makes his, uh, he appoints a steward, right, pa ren Nefer, whose tomb we have on, uh, in Thebes, Haran Nefer never mentions the seals. He never mentions, again, having control over the seal uh, treasuries. But he has control over the herds and the lands and the people. It's exactly what I was talking about. So if you go through, I think it was the priesthood was recognizing that the only thing they could do was to sort of contain it. Uh, that's my speculation. And I, it is speculative, I am telling you. Yeah. No, that would be, that would be the I who was the, uh, it, they called him the God's father, which is really uh, just someone who's an older, he might even been from the family, by the way, but Nefertiti's family. Um, but he would have been acting on behalf of Tanakhama to do that. But it was what I was saying when I mentioned that Nefertiti was already connecting with Amun is that clearly that decision was made even before Tanakhama came to the throne. They had made the decision they were going to restore the Temple of Amun. And I, I'm not suggesting necessarily that that was out of economic deprivation, but I, I don't think it would be surprising if it were, because we don't really have a lot of evidence that Akhenaten's religion was very popular anywhere outside of Amarna itself. And the temples that we have in the name of Aten from elsewhere are really, you can't really find a trace of them other than once in a while somebody's title that refers to it. You really can't, can't really find that it has any last effect at all. Horemheb was a very powerful already in the reign of Akhenaten and in the military, um, but he was kind of, in a way, kept at bay by I um, during Tutankhamun's reign. And it wasn't, he had to sort of wait until Tutankhamun had passed and I took the throne for four years before he could really assert himself. I mean, it, 
we don't know with certainty, but it looks as if forum hemp was actually in a bad odor with I and Tadaka. I just want to ask one more question, then I'll close it down. Um, what, what do you think of the, the recent um, idea of Nick Reeves that underneath Cartouche or Tut is the name on a capital way that we're not going to be and says that this is not? Underneath which Cartouche? Uh, uh, with the opening of the mouth. So oh, actually, oh, the, oh, the money oh. is. Yeah. The, yeah. Okay. I mean, I. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to dare say because, uh, you know, one would need to really take a look. I mean, I that whole business of where Nefertiti is buried uh, is, a, is a great one, you know, and I hope it gets more people to Egypt. Yes, I saw that too. <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually have no idea where he thinks the tomb of Nefertiti is. I, I mean, I, I'm guessing that he's putting it in the West Valley or someplace over in the closer to the Valley of the Kings. But I really, actually, don't know. I mean, he's he's trying to be very close. You know? Oh, okay. He thinks he has the monkey. Okay. Oh, just because then he's a DNA test. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Can you just say the last thing again? I want. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, of course, most of you know about the Amarna period. We know that there is a famous letter where the uh, 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 where the Egyptian queen seems to call herself a widow. Uh, Thank you. 